Hello everyone, today we talk about the ascent of the Pepinid dynasty. Uh, this is a topic we never addressed on Schwerpunkt as such. We definitely discussed um, you know, more than once about the, the development of the Carolingian Empire as a whole. Um, I dedicated now a, a pretty hefty playlist to Carolingian history and Frankish history in general. We discussed the <coughs> Frankish Merovingian Kingdom uh, in its essential lines. Today we are going to take a closer look, very, very essentially, actually, without a big deal of um, deepening in, into the details, but to the <coughs> rise of the Pepinid dynasty and its relation, let's say, with uh, uh, still what it was de facto still Merovingian Francia, practically, because you know that it's only in the mid-8th century that formally the the, the Pepinids as masters of palace um, depose uh, the, the, the Merovingian dynasty, or what was left of it, essentially, we will see it now, um, and get from the Pope the, um, uh, the confirmation of their own kingship, essentially, on that already existed de facto in, in Francia and now was formally, formally sanctioned. Um, naturally, the relation with the papacy are also very important. They're often overlooked also before the ascent of the Pe Pepinid or Carolingian dynasty. Um, the, uh, the idea is that actually the Franks had always had a very strong uh, bond with the Roman Church in some way since the beginning since Clovis, and this we'll have the, the opportunity to discuss it another time. For today, let's stick just to this. Really an outline. This is a, just a sort of an introduction to the period. Naturally, this has to be uh, deepened eventually. So, given a bit of background, uh, we've already seen how essentially at f a from from the sixth century, the Frankish kingdom um, underwent a progressive weakening of royal power, uh, especially as a result of the um, succession uh, clashes. Mm -hmm. The Franks had maintained, even at the royal level, the, um, the, the, the juridical custom of splitting the domains at every generation among the male uh, among the male sons i mean among the sons of the king as well so even though the frankish kingdom or empire as you, you prefer also in here there would be something to debate um was initially relatively centralized i mean it, it, it the, the dynasty uh, the merovingian dynasty had managed initially to really seize everything for for its own really you know de facto annihilating, literally taking out all the rest of the main, you know, the high fr Frankish nobility, both um, especially uh, the Ripuarians, but also the major concurrence to the same uh, Pepinid, uh, excuse me, to the same Merovingian dynasty among the Salians. The um, the, 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 f the kingdom had started, in fact, to, f to weaken because of this splitting that had occurred every generation. So just imagine having this pretty solid domain um, <coughs> that is made up fundamentally by Francia proper, that is this wide area essentially stretching from from Brittany roughly to the Scaled River. Uh, so pretty substantial, big substantial Atlantic region of Northern Europe substantially and also a very fertile one, not to be forgotten that, however, gets split unavoidably among the generation. However, Francia wasn't just the only part. This was... Francia was properly the Frankish kingdom, you know. Uh, it was this, um, if you want, in, in broad terms, ethnic uh, kingdom, like the other ones that had been born um, I into, into, the, into, Western, into Western Europe after the um, dissolution of of the western half of the Roman Empire, and it, it it definitely corresponded to the idea that, I mean, theoretically that that land had been occupied by the Frankish people as such. Um, really, I have discussed extensively um, in certain videos, and now I will tell you how this process had occurred, how actually the Franks seized. Um, Goal, 
more broadly and now we will see also we will finish about um, <coughs> if you go into Frankish history playlist for instance um, very important for understanding this process is the Franks and Clovis from Germany to Empire uh, the Frankish Merovingian Kingdom these are the, the titles of the videos there are several others now we will quote um, there is also, generally speaking, 6th century balance of power, gods versus Franks and Constantinople, that is, you know, a broader look at the international situation of the Merovingian, uh, the Merovingian Empire, or kingdom, as you want to call it, during the 6th century when still the, the Gothic axis was actually a thing, and the relations with Constantinople were still very, very intense. Um, and this is really the point: is that the Franks didn't just expand at that uh, in that moment, just um, on uh, in in this portion of would would be today's roughly northern France, Benelux, and parts of western Germany. But uh, they also had extended with with arms um, through victorious military campaigns their mm, dominion over other populations, chiefly the, uh, the Burgundians, the Alamanni, the, uh, the Aquitanians, partly also on the Thuringians, and um, along the Danube, uh, exercising um, you know, a varied influence, I mean, in intensity, over even the, Bava the, the, the Bavarians. And naturally, this um, kingdom w was a pretty big thing in the sense, it, it, it and it looked more as an empire objectively, because even in, um, for instance, in German historiography, um, all these chunks that made up the, 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 the Frankish domains were in fact called as Teilreichen. And and this is important because it gives you, it literally means a, a, a piece, a, a chunk of, a, of, of, of kingdom slash empire. And definitely, from a Merovingian perspective, I think it would be more correct to to define it, especially at the apex of Merovingian power, uh, m most likely like an empire, because it was really the Franks exercising their power of many other peoples that uh, weren't even kind of um, uh, kingdoms anymore. I mean, the Frankish kingdom was in fact a kingdom. It was a king. It was in this case even a dynasty proper. It was something very um, very exceptional into the Germanic world. We we have explained in those videos I mentioned before the how uh, the, what is really important to understand f in understanding Merovingian history is the 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 I wouldn't say it's centralization in a modern sense because that's not the point. But really the acu the um, ac mm, I would say. The 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 hoarding, the, the com accumulation of prerogatives mm -hmm. in the hands of the Merovingian dynasty that had de facto imposed itself on the world Frankish people through violence, through blackmail, through you know solid authority that naturally derived also by you know political and military capabilities in many ways, but definitely wasn't played very well. And th that is an exception, because in the Germanic world, the, the, the idea of a dynasty was extremely, um, completely, extremely opposed, usually. The, idea, the, the, the traditional idea of the Germans is that there were only freemen. It was naturally a very uh, ideal, um, uh, utopistic um, picture. Um, but an ideology in general, obviously, as we always say, aristocracies always, always governed into the Germanic world. It doesn't matter how much primitive or, or few stratified it could be at certain times. At all times, in tribal society, there is an aristocracy of some kind. Now, what the, the, the Merovingians did, and, and it wasn't it, it wasn't nothing theological. I mean, it could go in a very different direction. Also, for the Franks, just like for other peoples, the, said the Merovingian dynasty managed to create a kingdom based on the uh, <coughs> grandeur of this dynasty itself. Naturally, it happened through several dynamics that are not exclusively, um, let's say related to, to the Frankish people as such, chiefly because, as you understand, the Franks now were settling 
into an area that was inhabited also by other populations that were, you know, majority seemingly, and they, however, were already structured. There was an Episcopal elite. Not surprisingly, the Merovingian dynasty was immediately tied um, to the um, to the Gallo-Roman uh, elite that w was, in this sense, very very important, instrumental in the in the building of its own power. Uh, it would remain into French history. Uh, you know, if you know, you want to hear, there was nothing French uh, yet. But the the uh, there is a, a political um, let's say there is a continuity in the political bond between the this northern Frankish, uh, this 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 Frankish monarchy, especially Western Frankish half of the Neustria, say, and the local um, episcopal elites that would remain at the base of, you know, think about the Capetians, eventually how they, they built the Western Frankish kingdom and later becoming the kingdom of France. Um, so, in the in, in, in this dynasty had. Therefore, a, a highly concentrated power and resources in their hands. I mean, if you wonder why the Franks became so powerful, um, definitely happened for, for, for several reasons. First of all, this immediate centralization into the hands of the Merovingian dynasty. It really made a big difference. As we will see now, yeah, they, they basically destroyed themselves through this succession system that really brought nothing to that, but there are other factors as well. We shouldn't really criticize too much the Merovingians today. I will try even to challenge the stereotype of the idler uh, kings, you know, the idea that this, because it's partly built also by Carolingian uh, propaganda later in time. Mm. Um, but secondly, definitely the, um, I would say the, uh, the insertion, the admission, the integration, the assimilation of the Frankish element into the Gallo-Roman society. Um, a Gallo-Roman society that was um, come out relatively, um, let's say, intact tr into the, the early medieval times, differently from other places in, in, in Europe that, you know, basically collapse in terms of, of, of uh, Romanized society. It would happen in Britain, it would happen in Italy, um, and, and that was a factor eventually to, to develop, you know, in, in that context, for instance, power on different bases. But also another very important element, it's very structural, very environmental, very, very evident, um, socio-economical in nature, is the enormous, and I mean enormous, amount of agricultural resources. This was a largely agrarian world, as you can imagine. Uh, France uh, had, and still has, by the way, a, a, an, an incredible amount of agricultural goods. At the time, this really meant a lot, because controlling all these very fer fertile, humid uh, Atlantic plains uh, essentially stretching from the Pyrenees to to Denmark, uh, equated to, I mean, not quite to Denmark because there were a bit the Saxons in the middle, but I mean the concept is still, you know, there was a Frankish influence even in there. Um, but you know, it's it, it means having an enormous amount of resources concentrated in your hands. And what made a big deal of difference at this point, especially during the sixth century, etc., was occupying these lands. Um, not all, basically, n no other, there was no other Germanic population at this point that had seized such a huge amount of resources. At this point, Gaul, as a wall, was even wealthier than the, the Italian peninsula, for instance. I mean, in sheer quantity of, of goods. Mm -hmm. And this, naturally, you, you understand it, especially for such a warlike um, people like the Franks, um, equated to... Um, to access, to, to, to have available the resources for supplying the armies. And that's, by the way, the reason why even the Franks made it to progressively subdue all the populations that existed around them through these repeated campuses. There is a very structural dynamic in here. If you, you, know, if you read this, if you study this, this, not, this didn't mean that they couldn't do it literally 
all the time. We're not still um, also the, the same Merovingian organization. Sometimes it said you know it was a kind of a centralized thing. Well, yeah, I mean the, especially Clovis and his immediate su successors tried to to develop a, a system of functionaries that were actually just certain comitas that were sent out, as they were counts essentially sent out into this um, local, uh, especially in this kind of foreign or you know let's say different ethnically different countries like you know the Alama we we're talking about ethnicity here we may we mean it especially from a political and juridical point of view you know the the Alamanni, the Burgundians, etc which on the long run actually they they ended up to 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 mingle with the local elites the the history of the franks in in, uh, in general the, of the west, of the germans in 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 the west is uh, it's been a, a history of assimilation of hybridation if you want so by the time of the Carolingian dynasty, even when you hear um, that there were still, you know, Alamanni, Burgundians, etc., it's not that there were really, you know, the same people that existed there in the 16th. They were, especially when talking about the elites, um, they were essentially a mix between a Franks and whatever other ethnicity existed at a local level. But just for saying that, um, still in the 6th century, even carrying out a, a substantial military campaign aimed at conquering and subduing one people was um, it was a big thing. I mean, it really dried up um, lots of uh, res um, agricultural resources of surplus of stocks and, um, and so on. So it, it was still something mass. In, to the 6th century, it was not really a, a moment of great, a particularly great economical dynamism. At this point, then there is the crisis, and that's where I think it's an under, uh, you know, with the Justinian's plague um, and the general contraction and resizing of the, you know, of the Eur Eurasian system as a whole from from a demic and economical point of view. It's often uh, often under, uh, you know, overlooked when talking about the also the contraction of the Merovingian, you know, the the, the weakening of the Merovingian Empire. Mm -hmm. Uh, objectively, the Merovingians had this political problem of so splitting and eventually Frank into several parts, but um, objectively, they, they were even lacking resources. So this idea of splitting and also controlling from a narrower base, it's part of the general process that starts happening also elsewhere in Europe. Um, it's evident even into, in part into the Byzantine Empire within the same uh, Roman boundaries, and not just the ones that eventually lost the ends of the Arabs or other peoples. It's um, it's a complex um, series of factors, um, which, um, by the way, brought also to the problem that um, you know these outer um, peoples that had been subdued by the Franks actually, and this is very interesting, remained even during the time of crisis, of deeper crisis of the Merovingian dynasty between essentially the, the, sem the seventh and the, the second half of the seventh, the mid seventh, if you want, um, and the and mid eighth century, um, they remained formally subdued to the Franks. This is pretty interesting. I mean, obviously there were the local elites enjoyed a, a large autonomy, um, de facto. Theoretically, the, the the Merovingians had expanded even their concept of private property that sometimes in their mind overlapped with what was public in practice um, into those lands as well. So theoretically there was a law that uh, came from you know, the 6th century that basically stated that th there were public goods in there that belonged to the Frankish king. Now, great part of these um, properties had been usurped by the, uh, by the local aristocracies broadly meant now it's complicated even to to explain how these aristocracies were effectively actually operating well in 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 um let's say in together with the with the allowance of the various branches of the Merovingian dynasty that at this point were fighting one against the other um but let's say that the the idea that there had been a sort of a Frankish empire with a public uh, authority embodied by the Merovingians um, was pretty much out there. Mm -hmm. 
this is quite interesting, especially from a juridical point of view, because the Franks definitely had their tribal laws. They had the Salian law. It was the truly public, the properly public law. You know, the idea of the, that it was essentially the, the law of the Frankish people at this point of the Salian Franks, but the, um, which was a, a tribal, an ethnic right uh, that belonged to all the Franks as freemen. This is the idea. But at the same time, there was the um, ideology taking root in many ways that the, um, and this is very important to understand the Frankish mentality, even f because it, it's something that remained actually well well alive throughout all the Carolingian period as well, and even beyond, because it's at, at, at the base of the same development of feudalism uh, in the way, it, you know, of Frankish feudalism in particular. Um, that is the idea that everything at that point um, in, the f in, in the kingdom essentially belonged, it was a sort of private possession of the Frankish dynasty. I stress dynasty, I don't say kings or monarchs, because theoretically there were other count, uh, other, you know, other populations, Germanic populations that had something like a king or a dux or something similar. But this was conceived as a sort of temporary thing. For instance, into to the Longobard kingdom, the monarchy was elected. Um, if you look at the Anglo-Saxons, you know, before they eventually set up in motion a, a monarchy, you know, it took a, a freaking long time. Um, into Visigothic Spain, you have essentially a, a sort of dynasty that is also elective in there, because it was always kind of elective, even when it was dynasticized in, in some form. Um, even the same, you know, the beginning of the Capetians, uh, you know, still in the Western Frankish kingdom was theoretically elective, you know. But there is a big difference. For instance, in Visigothic Spain, yeah, there were kings, but they had they had a, a weakening. Um, their authority was weakening. You know, it was relatively high into the um, to the fifth, sixth century. Then eventually began to to, to fade. Um, they the, the aristocracy took over. Well, to the Frankish kingdom, something similar happens. But, never, but nevertheless, the, the idea that the Merovingian dynasty had been kind of this um, divinely elected dynasty uh, that had to rule in virtue of its own blood, mm -hmm. just think how this is important also for the concept of, you know, of, of nobility, eventually how it developed in Europe, um, never died. And in fact, what we will see now with the Pepinids is and it's how ba they, they substantially recognized um, the Merovingian authority in in in, in the bloodline uh, up to the end. By the way, this caused very um, even very disturbing um, events into this um, situation because the, when the, the various branches of the Merovingian dynasty began to kill one another, you have. Maybe it's a bit dramatized by the by the literature, by the historiography uh, of the time that actually had also certain moralistic um, intents. Then obviously the Carolingians kind of had a depicted the Merovingian period in a kind of dark uh, way, uh, and so on. But objectively, it was a huge violence that was aimed at the same Merovingian dynasty. I mean. Within the, the same the, the the members of the same of the same dynasty, we're talking about children that were whose heads were smashed on rocks by these Frankish warriors because those were you know maybe the hairs uh, uh, of the branch of, of that part of the Merovingian dynasty they didn't want them to succeed to the throne so you have these extremely violent clashes that um, deeply undermine the same Merovingian power at the same time but uh, but basically strengthened, at least from an ideological point of view, remaining over time, the concept of a dynasty. The concept that, that was so very um, strange um, to the Germanic theory of a dynasty that rules over freemen by some sanction that, at this point, it's, uh, was e even conceived as a sort of divine one or at least divinely uh, led in many ways. Um, in those videos I actually discussed pre pre in detail how the Merovingians built this up. I mean, even the same imperial 
uh, grandeur uh, of the Merovingians, uh, the time of Clovis, was actually won because there was even a formal recognition uh, by Constantinople um, uh, to the Merovingians of the uh, vicariate of, of the Gauls at the time. I think Clovis was even sent a sort of purple uh, mantle from, from Constantinople to and certain other um, insignia of, of, of power of, of imperial authority just you know to, to stress that it was and here the, around this around the uh, allegiance with the ecclesiastical elites um, the uh, basically the annihilation of the uh, competing um, aristocracy the Merovingians built an image of themselves that um, built up in, in many ways what would have become ideologically the French, the French monarchy, and this is important because it's something that pertains, pertained um, mostly actually, what would have become in fact w Western, you know, the, the France proper. It was essentially the, the, the Neustria of the Merovingian times, and this had to do naturally a lot, as you can imagine, with the with the local romance. Uh, society, the Gallo-Roman world was quite quite different from the, the other, the eastern chunk of, the, of Francia was the, the uh, Austrasia. Mm -hmm. um, in the east, that was instead much more Germanic uh, in fashion, both ethnically, linguistically. It was also less urbanized. It was also poorer, um, but that you know probably assimilated less or this concept of dynastization how although you know it definitely it existed as well i mean in forms of clientarily um dynamics and relatively to clientarily dynamics a very important um where well maybe we'll talk about it uh, later or just right now so i will tell you later um but there is always to consider what the the local society already was because the Franks yeah they seemed that seemingly they had a substantial even ethnic impact in on northern France because it seemingly it was a quite depopulated area um, in um, in many ways but um, it um, um, it, it still inherited largely the uh, Essentially, the the, the, so, the social economical s structures of of Roman Gaul, of Gallo Roman Gaul, as you, as you want to call it, this is very important because there is a great continuity, especially in Western Francia, with um, with late the late late antique society in many ways, and and this also allowed paradoxically even the same Carolingians to rise with the dynamics that we will. We will see now. So this, I think, was an important introduction because otherwise we can't understand other things. Um, because yeah, this is these are all things I already told. But uh, theoretically, every video has to work as a monad in part. You, so these premises were kind of necessary. Um, so in this splitting of the Merovingian dynasty into several chunks, you can imagine that the, the central authority vanished. It vanished um, de facto as a political and military power. Um, the peripheries were left even always increasing ever more autonomous. Um, lots of resources were used to to, to fight in in, in practically within the same Frankish kingdom. Um, you can argue that at, at a certain point, especially towards the end of the seventh century, there was not a Frankish kingdom anymore. I mean, if you really want to talk about political consistency, it, it's not before the Carolingians that the Franks, I mean, or what were was were meant to be Franks um, by name, came back to, you know, to to create something compact in some way. Also very progressively, very slowly, even the same Carolingian dynasty was not really meant to, to achieve necessarily what it did. There were also certain several fortunate events, um, I including um, the fact that uh, great rulers like Charlemagne 
and um, uh, Louis the Pierce eventually were uh, devoid of of, uh, of male siblings, and this allowed them to basically narrate the whole thing. Because otherwise, you you realize that the, the Frank the this uh, great Frankish Empire recollapsed eventually in the same exact way. In practice, well, not in the same exact way because the dynamics were slightly different, but you know it still you know microscopically recrumbled on its own. And you understand here the real problem: there was no public structure. Uh, this is probably the most important thing you have to think of. If you understand this concept, you understand a big chunk of, of medieval history. I mean, the, fa the fact that the Franks were completely, um, and, and especially with after the rise of the Merovingian dynasty, but partly also before, because this was the transposition of a Germanic ideal on a broader scale, at, at a sort of dynastic scale, but also the Germanic freemen, Albeit having a, a clear idea of what public was as a, you know, in, in its tribal society, still uh, retained that this public authority had basically was a, a sum of private autonomies that had to ensure that no one would take over. So the concept of public, like it had existed into the Roman world, was deeply strange er, to to the Frankish mindset. Um, it was paradoxically more solid. In other countries, like like in Longobard, Italy, like in in, uh, in parts um, in Visigothic Spain, uh, although it, it's a bit of a problem, but th this is also a very important um, chapter um, that we have to rediscuss, especially when talking about the long about the Longobards. Um, I may have to necessarily to make a video about that um, because too often. S s Certain early medieval dynamics are misunderstood. Many people think that there was that the German that, that, that there was no public authority, solid public authority from an institutional point of view. In certain contexts, it, there was. I mean, it might have been the exception actually of Longobard Italy, but it's still meaningful to point out that it existed and to explain why in other countries it did not exist. The dynastization of Frankish power. Um, was created through the Carolingians was created with the firm idea in mind that everything that had been conquered, so this was done by a right of conquest, belonged to the to the chieftain as a private domain. So in, in, in it's as if in the Merovingian mindset there was nothing, and in the Frankish mindset as a wall, and in the aristocracies that now dwelled in the. In the, in, in the Merovingian Empire, including the Gallo-Roman ones, there had not been a real public authority. Everything was private. Everything was personal, was owned as a personal private good, essentially, including the kingdom at the, broad, at the higher hierarchy uh, by the, the Merovingian dynasty. So the idea of a public authority where there is a kind of centralized institution that dictates certain law that makes it. It basically didn't exist. It didn't exist nor in the theory, nor in the practice. At a local level, tribally, especially in Australia, there was this idea that, yeah, there were public assemblies at, a, I don't know, at a town, at village level, and so on. But that, that was it. The, these immense domains were ruled by increasingly aggressive and voracious aristocracies that were deeming um, everything to be on their own. Uh, feudalism was born was not born, um, you know, just you know from from a sudden transformation that occurred at some time in post Carolingian times. It was something that was deeply rooted in the privatization of. I wouldn't say just early medieval, but even late antique uh, social structures. If you're interested in, in this, there are a couple of, um, of videos I made. Uh, the, the, the first one, most importantly, was the, the Frankish Commendatio that we will discuss now. The, the, the title is The Frankish Commendatio, The Origins of the Vassalatic Beneficiary System, which is actually the, uh, the more poignant um, um, element in there. The other one, it can be, it's mostly related to Roman society, but in the case of gold, this is basically valid also from when the, the, the Franks came in. This, this, there is this other video made, it's called Transformation of the West, 3rd to 6th century. 
that deals essentially with the transformation of the um, of Roman society towards a more privatized pri pri privatized fashion uh, in into during the late antique and then it was reinforced under under the Franks. Uh, interesting uh, in this process um, is also perhaps another video that I like to to quote because it's kind of meaningful even in, because it looks at even at the productive uh, system in itself that is called um, from from the late antique villa to the early medieval cortes mm -hmm. that is actually pretty pretty meaningful because um, now especially in, in Frankish gold power the, the gold had substantial urban centers um, especially in the south but also in the north I mean there was this great episcopal centers that especially that's the area where not surprisingly the the itinerant uh, Frankish royal course uh, gravitated that would be today's northeastern France so essentially Paris was already chosen as a sort of capital naturally um, the, the, this was pretty fluid but in fact it, the, Merovin the same Merovingians had many residences there were uh, in the country there were man big, big mansions when they lived and there was no great continuity with urban uh, developments in there, especially in northern France, but nevertheless, there was this transformation of the world that that so did the the even the fortification of the villas, the late Roman villas into uh, Gallo-Roman society, and the, the the premises essentially of what would have become the even partly the encastellation, because the bases in this sense were already present. Um, there is another video if you're interested specifically about this into the Frankish world, although it's uh, very late um, compared to to what we are discussing uh, today. Is this other video on the on the, the proliferation of um, spontaneous castles? And the title is the Pistre. Capitulary 864 and spontaneous castles uh, in Western Francia. Uh, it's at the time of uh, that's a, essentially a, um, a capitulary of Charles the uh, Bald. But you know it, 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 it's so revealing. It's interesting to read. Actually, in that video, I read uh, from the Wall Capitulary. I mean, not the Wall Capitulary, but the, that part. It deals with the with fortresses. Excuse me, I'm a bit tired today, but I hope to sound effective, nevertheless. So, um, it's very important to understand that this, the, the fact that disintegration of the Frankish unity into um, during the 7th century, roughly, because it's from this environment that the Pepin is stamped in many ways, it's it's uh, th there were all these uh, functionaries called um, masters of palace, which comes from major domus. So it's literally the would be the, the major domesticus in, in in practice that dealt. You know, you, you, it's not really a major dome as we imagine it. It, it was essentially the person who administered the the royal palace. So it was more of a Kind of a honorific title, I don't know. Maybe at the beginning it was actually born as a, as a simple administrator that now was a seizing uh, great um, was you know increasing its power as a political figure, someone who actually managed much more than the, the, the royal palaces, the royal residences, and really had its its own command and service. Several. Um, even armored retinues that had a, a great political influence and so on. Excuse me, I drink a little bit. It is <coughs> this is important because it's as if <coughs> um, 
you know, you realize that the the spread, the concession of privileges of for this clients, royal clients, was immediately ever, ever ever since the beginning of Frankish history into Gaul. Um, very very present since the beginning. So the Carolingians really didn't invent anything. They just revived, intensified certain practices that were pretty much common. Uh, in that world, even before the German, um, you know, the Frankish invasion of Gaul, it was already existing in Gallo-Roman society. Um, so, as we've seen, this Major Domus was initially in charge of all the orga- organizational matters of of the court, the so-called palatium slash domus. There is an important difference in here because. Um, palatium in uh, you know in the early medieval vocabulary is something very um, very important. Uh, palatium is the, the 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 palace. It has a very physical connotation. Basically, stresses the the permanence of this building. Even it literally built you know in 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 something. I mean not literally because that's not the. But you know, um, the palatium is the center of public power. It's usually a permanent structure. Um, it works as the physical, pr- you know, symbol of the of public authority. The domus instead is something much more private, as you understand. Excuse me. The domus is literally the house, not the house as a you know a regular house like the insula where the, the average Roman lived in the city. That the domus is actually a residence. But a private one. Mm-hmm. So when you find even the title of domesticus, etc., it, it's you you have to understand the familiarity. Also in other contexts, uh, even at the Byzant- Byzantine court, um, of of these fears. So the fact that these were called as maiores um, uh, domini, it, it, it's important because it's. Um, it, it stresses also the private nature in part of this relation that existed in um, in, uh, in in this world, and over time, the 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 ma- the major dome came to the to designate essentially the three um, functionaries that were posed by the Merovingian sovereigns at the head of the administration of the three uh, major chunks of the Merovingian uh, of Francia or better of the Merovingian power broadly meant because they weren't even all part of, of France proper actually on these were three or four we're talking about Austrasia so Eastern Francia, Neustria, Western Francia, and even Burgundy. Uh, so not not a Frankish land proper, but still a, a, a chunk where a, a branch of the Merovingian dynasty had settled for making war against the um, I mean, I'm stressing now the word. I'm, excuse me, I, I, I find a map um because I had found a map back in the day when I was thinking about the Merovingian dynasty that looks beautiful. Maybe I will be able to post today. Uh I can't find it now, I'm sorry. But um maybe I will post it later. But the, if you look at essentially and the other bigger chunk was essentially Aquitaine. Mm. It also was a very different um country from 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 Francia uh, Aquitaine is would be part of southern Gaul it had always in, been inhabited even by was different even from the rest of the of Gaul in many ways i mean since antiquity since the roman writers said you know that basically Aquitaine was not part of Gaul proper i mean it was physically geographically but not ethnically, as the Aquitanians were not uh, Celts, um, they were not uh, Celtic uh, Gauls. So 
um, that had maintained kind of a different language. It had in part Romanized more, especially in the very south of Aquitaine proper, so it actually on the part of the, on the side of the Mediterranean border. In the north of Aquitaine, there was not, had not actually even been a big deal of Romanization. Um, but uh, nevertheless, Aquitaine had maintained a kind of a kind of an ethnic character on its own, even though there the were, the were never kind of, I mean, since the Ar Iron Age, did anything unitary. I mean, not even in the Iron Age. Of course, there was this people of the Aquitanians, however, they, but after that, there was never like an Aquitanian, autonomous Al Aquitanian power, that's what I meant. The same Franks actually had... Uh, that this is Aquitaine was the point where the the Visigoths had settled initially into Gaul, and the Franks had defeated them, uh, had uh, defeated the, um, the 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 Visigoths famously at the Battle of uh, Vouillet, where basically the, the Visigoths lost all the territories, but uh, of Gaul, but the so-called Septimania. That is this tiny stripe of land that would be in today's France, Languedoc Roussillon, that in fact man was maintained into the uh, the Battle of Vouillet was in 507, if I'm not wrong, um, and that's where Septimania remained into the Visigothic hands. This is important because it uh, even gives you a, a, pro a you know dimension of the distances, you know, and the idea that problem it was a problem from northern France to come campaigning even in the, to the south. Then there were the, the mountains from you know Atlantic uh, separating in the watershed between Atlantic Aquitaine and and southern Aquitaine was essentially the the old Gallia Narbonensis, and in fact even when the when the Goths um, were conquered by the Arabs. Um, the Arabs basically extended their territory up to, uh, to, to, to Septimania. And up after the same battle of uh, Poitiers in 732, so this great uh, victory that was also propagated by the, the Carolingians and such, um, of the Franks over the, 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 the Arabs, let's say, um, even though it's not a quite accurate term, um, the, the, the Muslims maintained Septimania. So it wasn't even, you know... Um, and they ca kept raiding into southern France even after, well after immediately after Poitiers actually. So also that battle, the battle was important, was objectively important, uh, but it, it has to be redimensioned in its strategical, broader strategical significance and meaning. It was m much more important under other points of view, that are not less important, but that has to be have to be understood in, in some way. Um, the the point I was making is that at this point the the Merovingian uh, kingdom was split in essentially into four parts, two of which belonged to the f properly Frankish lands of the north and the other chunks of Aquitaine and Burgundy and so on. But the the real centers of power actually were all concentrated in the center. And just imagine you have this very schematically a square uh, split into uh, uh, other four squares. And, and th there is a middle point in this main square that is the point of which all, all these, um, the corner of these all these squares meet. Well, that was a part of cent central slash northern France, where, um, in fact, the, the all these various branch of the Merovingian dynasty had concentrated what would be essentially their own capitals, their own centers of power. So, in spite this the wall square is pretty large and it extends uh, far and wide and uh, to different corners from from Brittany to Provence from uh, from Germany to, to to the Pyrenees the real core of power was was there in the center and these centers of power the various Merovingian branches were kind of uh, close in this sense also for strategical reasons for fighting for intervening more directly trying to seize constantly the um the um, all the the other um, Merovingian capitals. So these were essentially brothers tra trying to to occupy one uh, constantly. These these various centers. This was very important because, in spite uh, this, the the, the whole f kingdom was disintegrated, and there was still a centrality posed. I mean, literally from geographically in in this area. Um, that um, eventually contributed also to to maintain a sort of a, a, a point of balance essentially in, in, as a center 
as a central authority for that kingdom that eventually also the same Pippinid came uh, came to exploit. Uh, the main uh, trouble in which the, um, you know, let's say better, the real collapse or the, the, the non coming back point or uh, not going back point of, of, of the Merovingian power was um, 639 uh, sim- ideally let's say um, because this is the um, the year in which um, the uh, the the 10 uh, year uh, rule of the king uh, Dagobert Merovingian king Dagobert finished uh, Dagobert is uh, remembered as historiographically as kind of a good king but um, our knowledge on a 7th century Frankish king is naturally pretty conjectural in many ways um, as many other kings it, around in Europe we can say that sometimes good kings were the ones where there had been a good kingdom you know a good being let's say and, and the reason for Dagobert is definitely that he was essentially the had remained alone um, as a Merovingian dynast, so his siblings had, you know, the, the other branches had died out in some way, so he had been able to kind of recollect in some fashion the original unity of the kingdom. Eventually, when he died, eventually the the, the situation um, collapsed once again, the, the kingdom split, um, and the, his successors began to, to re uh, re you know, tear the, the, the system apart. Um, so it's, it's like with other kings that you hear in history, oh, well, the, that king was the, the peaceful, and you find out that it was actually m- maybe even more violent than others, but simply because he had remained alone, there was no one to fight against anymore, he was remembered by, by, like the peaceful, because that's... It. So it's a very... Also the nicknames are sometimes can be very misleading, um, in some way, but seemingly Dagobert had um, you know, uh, tried at least to, to stem this process of fragment- fragmentation that naturally didn't derive from you know because he was smarter than others. Obviously, all the other Merovingians had had wanted to end the process of fragmentation, but simply with their private um, based mindset, they they obviously wanted to to uh, re-compact the Merovingian domains just into their own individual hands, so knocking out their brothers in. But the ultimate end was definitely, you know, recompacting these domains. It's it's a sort of, it's a kind of historical constant, the idea that powers want to expand and consolidate and maintain, um, uh, you know, their, their, their dominance, their their authority intact over time. Mm-hmm. So at this point, um, we can say, broadly speaking, that the political hegemony of the, of the various branches passed into the hands of Neustria. Um, Neustria was advantaged by certain uh, factors. And also here was a very fertile land, was also probably the, the best, um, the real core of the of Merovingian and later even Carolingian power because the Carolingians definitely came from from Austrasia, but they, as eventually as kings, they mostly also strengthened their bases into Neustria, and that was was evident. And Neustria was uh, had these very important episcopal centers, was well controllable um, from a strategical point of view. It's all relatively flat land. I mean, you can. I mean, not complete flatland, especially in the French part, but let's say that it's easy controllable. France in general is, as a territory, merely as a territory, is very easily controllable in many ways. It has this uh, few main centers that are c- well connected by roads. There are n- usually not major natural obstacles. I mean, uh, at the time, surely in the 7th century, even crossing the Loire, or you know, getting to the uh, towards the massive central, it was kind of a problem. But uh, generally speaking, the territory is is this huge basin of agricultural resources. You can relatively dominate in a relatively plain um, landscape. There were lots of forests, though, not so many as in Germany. So this didn't hamper eventually the also the communications and so etc. More than much. 
so Neustria at this point gets the upper hand or even on Austrasia that as we've seen was um, kind of poor, uh, more primitive and ultimately uh, however b war more warlike less urbanized etc and um, um, but this injurance on ne uh, of, of Neustria on Austrasia was to be countered by a dynasty of major domes that were destined to rise as in fact the one of the greatest dynasties in, in world history uh, that uh, was born uh, fr uh, out of the uh, marriage between the son of Arnulf, uh, Bishop of Metz, and the daughter of the um, majordome Pippin of London. Um, these were the Pippinids, eventually the, the Carolingians. Um, from the birth of the Carolingian dynasty we can't understand much. The, the, it w was the very nature of this uh, Frankish world. Uh, here we see the marriage between the son of a of a bishop from Metz, that is, you know, this cross area between. It was a intensely kind of more German area than than Romans one, but still definitely tied to this. And the, the, so, it, however, a part of a broadly meant Gallo-Roman uh, episcopal elite. And the uh, daughter of this uh, majordome, Pippin of London, was was instead a kind of a more military, um, you know, environment. However, the the two things were actually quite blurred. But it's very important because this time, by the way, you 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 understand that bishops had children. Normally, uh, was really not forbidden by the the canons at that point. Obviously, already. But we're talking about fra the, 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 there was a kind of a adversion. Theoretically, the clergy had to be chased in some way, but uh, it was not really forbidden. Not even popes at this point were kind of, uh, um, you know, they, they had children in, in, in their own way. But uh, you have to think also what, what Central Europe here in the Frankish world really was. It was a world that was still very, very much um, superficially very superficially Romanized, even very superficially Christianized in many ways. Uh, the Franks now were fully Christian, but by formally. But you can imagine the beliefs, the practices, the customs were definitely quite, um, you know, quite mixed. Um, the same uh, Carolingian reforms of the clergy were really stemmed from the, the acknowledgement that objectively the Frankish clergy couldn't even read the Bible in Latin because they didn't understand it. Um, committing, by the way, certain mistakes that are kind of very weird and also doctrinally you know, quite debatable. You know, if th There is large evidence of how this actually worked. Um, um, we are relatively lucky to have this um, information. Um, so it was a world of aristocrats that were highly involved in political and military matters, uh, including bishops. Uh, in Gaul, especially, this had been quite evident. Um, this was also very important for the eventual relation of the Carolingians with the Church, both in the creation of the Pepinian bulk of power from a clientarly point of view and eventually because of the participation of the church into the Carolingian Empire uh, and Carolingian government in many ways and an and army and military and so on. Um, and we will see in a while exactly why. So because of of the origins of the Carolingians, sometimes we we design this um, this uh, dynasty as the Ar Ar Arnulfingian Pippinid one because it was born from 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 the from the lineage of Arnulf of Metz and Pippin of London. So the, the Arnulfingian Pippinids are or Pippinid Arnulfingians, whatever you want to call them, um, are essentially Carolingians. The Carolingians take their name uh, honorifically, let's say, from from um, Charles Martel. So that's where you say Carolingians, because at that point it was also a name, you know, like 
uh, you know, we all stem from, from that particular guy because he's been great in our family and so on. It, indeed, Charles Martel was really the, let's say, the very first strong Carolingian that, that, that achieved much because also the rise of these families is very, very old. As you understand, it took century, a, cent- a good century before this dynasty fully consolidated its power, even among the other aristocracies that were emerging at this point, um, and so on. And um, these were, uh, as we've seen, th- there were many matrimonial and patrimonial strategies. Um, the Carolingians, through this um, through, you know, through the, the were already at this point um, the owners of an immense um, um, estate, uh, land estate. I mean, really, an immense one. So they, they, they had definitely the resources, the clientele, the the followers, the retinues to carry out a very, a very substantial um, and very consistent political and military activity. So they, <coughs> although up to Charles Martel, really, there was no um, real reason for which they had to emerge among the all, all the other major domes and so on. Even, even the same um, succession was pretty, um, pretty strange because actually the these aristocracies had lots of. I mean, uh, these these various um, aristocrats had lots of 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 of, um, of children from many different women. Some, uh, among the mo- f- some of the mo- among the most famous Carolingians, some were, were actually bastards. Um, for them, it was not really a problem of sort, and and that's the reason why I'm, I I was saying that these were superficially Christianized and Romanized uh, people because they they basically um, considered kind of being just the son of someone as you know being a freeman, being a um, being equal in many ways. This this egalitarian system is very important to understand from a cultural point of view because it is the one that in spite of, of, of the macroscopical evidence that every political entity at this point in the Frankish world was doomed um, to collapse at, at every generation because of the splitting of the inheritance, the Franks never gave up the idea that uh, Every son had to to an inherit something, and that's why all of these wars and violence and and and, and, and ensued in many ways. So the the Carolingians obtained, um, um, they, they managed to to, to render, however, um, their own uh, majordom um, charge um, hereditary. Hmm? And and this allowed them progressively to um, to dispose to to access to the vast um, uh, tax um, system, the royal fiscus, hmm, to um, to form through it and through the distribution of lands and properties, a very um, numerous and powerful armed um, clientele. So, the majordomes were controlling what was theoretically the, the public administration and were basically seizing it for their own and uh, profiting from it, and through these resources, creating personal retinues, private armies, and which were constantly fighting. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, this system was working through the institution of the Vassaticum. Now we will comment. Um, but that is essentially at the base of the Vassalatic beneficiary system. So essentially I will give you, you know, some land and, and in exchange you will... Uh, a land that remains mine, this is very important, it remains mine, but I give it to you so that you can um, uh, essentially provide the, the military equipment that... Um, that you need for following me uh, to war. Mm-hmm. 
very importantly, the fact that the Carolingians stemmed from from Austrasia is um, and, and that they eventually made it to 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 win over enemy the the the, the, the various competitors, especially the ones of Neustria, can be attributed in part, but just in part. It was probably the decisive factor, but it was still important to the fact that Austrasia had a was more militarized than the rest of of uh, of I would say of the Merovingian empires of all. Um, the Austrasians were Franks, but they were actually pretty akin to the Saxons. And something you hear, you see also very clearly from the way, even from their own laws, from their own practice, legal practices, and so on. Um, Austrasia had been um, a frontier, um, a very hot one. Um, it was being present on the Saxon border, where the Saxons uh, made incursions, constantly raids, and, um, and, and attacked constantly. So the Austrasians had developed as a sort of military society to, to, to cope with, with these problems. Um, they, they, they kept up in shape in many ways. They might have been poorer, more primitive, um, but they definitely were probably better. Um, the, the world society was more or organized for war in many ways. The Carolingians stem from, from this originally. Um, and they, um, they naturally maintain very strongly this character because the way they, they built, they rebuilt essentially the Frankish Empire was achieved through continuous war. And when I mean continuous, I mean con literally continuous. I mean these guys were uh, the the exception was not going to war in one year. You know, the Frank from the Frankish annals of this time, you know, the really the, the new that really made the difference was stating this year th there weren't campaigns. Because it was implicit that every other year was normal. It was a lifestyle to go to war. To real war, like the one you you massacre, you slaughter, you burn, you pillage, you ravage, and and this is how the Carolingians expanded their own domains. It was normal at the time, so it's not really uh, strange, but it, it, this is very important because it makes you understand also how the the military elite of feudal Europe was forged like, and why the Vassaticum was used in the system as you know to basically replenish the resources to, to make available this um, this pool of uh, of cavalry. At this point cavalry was expanding also for several reasons um, and, and also for the fact that Francia was so so large so that you needed a combat ready um, mounted force that could intervene quickly in the various areas of the empire to, to counter the enemy raids to be always um, in shape always ready to in effect so the Vassaticum as we were saying has deeper roots than just you know the, the Carolingian times um, it, it was definitely uh, had definitely a lot in common it was a lot of continuity with the Roman uh, commendatio it was a contract, essentially, on the basis of which a freeman, without, however, means of um, substance, of, um, I don't know how to say it, you couldn't, uh, without means of, uh, of sustenance, uh, and I mean literally, I mean, they, they, they even lacked food at one point, um, freely chose, as a freeman, to uh, put himself under the protection of a of a um, I mean of a great landowner, hmm? so he literally recommended himself to this great owner, and he basically was taken under uh, the owner's protection, um, and and uh, committing himself through a uh, an oath uh, of obedience of allegiance. So this is essentially, in, uh, this is in a nutshell how the Vassalatic beneficiary system was being developed in practice. So it was something very old. Mm -hmm. 
So in exchange for the servizium, so the service the, that was essentially given, the, the commanded received a benefition. So benefits, benefit. And so something, you know, beneficial really, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting observing servitium and beneficium because this explains a lot and very well what the, the nature of medieval serfdom was really like in many ways. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't slavery because servus, um, you know, ser from servitium comes from, and service eventually, uh, evidently came from, from idea of being a serf. You know, ser ser servitium in Latin is literally what the service uh, performs a as a serve. But in return, he got a beneficium. So um, that that really comes literally from you know to good to do some good. Hmm? Beneficere. So f to to do good practically, and, and it usually consisted this this beneficium usually consisted into a temporary um, concession of a uh, of an estate. This is important um, because it tells you essentially two things. The first one is that you were um, as a, uh, you were essentially bonded to your own master. So you were as in a sort of serf-like condition. Which doesn't mean that you were poor, and you were really a serf. I mean, the, the in the Roman in the case of the Roman commendatio, that was a bit more economical in in nature, in the sense that you know sometimes people were so poor that they couldn't, they preferred to live like even if they were freemen, they preferred to live like serfs, but at least to survive, not to starve to death. Into the French society at this point, it was a, I inherently an aristocratic society. Uh, you could be in service of someone, even if you were actually already some kind of well-off, you know, individual. Um, this is important because you find it at so many levels, also in other feudal societies, that there are extremely powerful people who are, as a matter of fact, kind of serfs. The, the majordom, the majordomus in this sense, was, was exactly this. I mean, um, being a, a majordomus essentially equated to be a sort of an, an assistant in theory to, to the king. You weren't quite the king. You were something subordinated, someone subordinated. Um, so this is the first thing. The second thing is that the beneficium was usually granted as a land estate. This is very important, very important because it tells you first of all what the, the base of uh, the economical base of that society was was land. Well, there was a very little monetary circulation um, at this time, so land was really the the basic, uh, not just in Frankish society at this point in the world Western Europe, of even the economical transactions, of the measurements of tax collection, was pretty much there. It was really the land that made the difference. Um, and uh, so this system got blended in. Uh, when I was saying that the Gallic society was eminently an aristocratic one, um, this is also very important to maintain because others, uh, other, um, you know, as we have seen, aristocracies were present all over the Latin Germanic world. Uh, there were naturally in Anglo-Saxon England, there were in Visigothic Spain, there were in Longobard Italy. But Frankish Gaul was very different because Frankish Gaul, as we said before, had actually passed relatively untouched, relatively intact as as an infrastructural system, um, as a socio-economical system, from the late antiquity into the early Middle Ages. Um, which means that differently from other regions of Europe, Gaul had not undergone major devastations, um, and that there had been a great conti continuity with the great Roman, um, you know, uh, 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 in the rule of the great um, Gallo-Roman senatorial uh, elite. This elite was was a real elite. I mean, it, it came straight from the Roman world, where there were these senators that 
that owned large amounts of land in the provinces and they ruled them uh, in a des uh, you know as if they were lords de facto of those lands the system passed relatively untouched into the Frankish hands or at least in the hands of the Franks of the Merovingians and the Gallo-Roman elite that blended together uh, in the, even the same origin of the Carolingians as we've seen is a perfect brilliant example of that an ecclesiastical Gallo-Roman elite which marries with a Germanic master of palace that's in a nutshell what uh, what early medieval Europe at least in the West originated from um, this Celtic, Germanic, and Roman background. Um, so even uh, there is another consideration that if you if you, if you look at the borders of uh, of the same Frank and how it was split. For instance, if you, if you look at Neustria, Neustria was basically is almost completely overlapped to the Roman province of the Gallia Belgica or Belgica, if you want. And it, it's not surprising that the, the, the Franks settled in there. Now, natural, the, the Franks had been kind of dwelling even before the fall of the West on that frontier because the Romans had settled them as federati on the, the essentially the Rhine frontier. Um, the the border between Gaul and Germany at the time wasn't the one. Bet uh, it wasn't the same like today's France and, and Germany. Um, today's Germany basically um, goes west uh, of the Rhine in part. It arrives up to cities like Trier, for instance. It was there were uh, Belgic. Uh, it was a Belgic territory. Uh, so that w this that part of the, of the Neustria actually encompassed all these lands that uh, that where the Romans had settled their own legions for for centuries. These legions had needed to eat. They needed supplies, so the Romans had put a great care into the administration of Gallia Belgica and had um, built up these large estates that were meant to feed uh, the legionaries of the the tens of thousands of legionaries that sta were stationed on the Rhine frontier. Um, so those structures were basically incorporated by the Franks. Uh, obviously, when when the Franks actually occupied Gallia Belgica, the Gallia Belgica wasn't faring that well. And it was, it was still relatively rich in, in, in as a, as a st structurally speaking, but, you know, it's not that those places where they were, they were depopulated. Um, you know, the, the, the Carolingians, for instance, stemmed from, from Cologne, the area around Cologne, uh, in many ways, that basically the Romans had settled the Franks there back in the day, um, because there was no one inhabiting those places, and actually Cologne had been Colonia Agrippina. It was one of the, the most important uh, Roman cities uh, in in the early empire. It was very large, very populated, and now nothing. So, however, certain infrastructures had remained in shape. So, even the military power of the Franks really was very importantly. Uh, framed on the base of this society. Now, at a social level of of this structure, sorry, at a at a social level, what happened is that uh, differently from other areas where the 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 barbarian invasions basically raised everything to the ground, or th however, well, actually, this never really happened as such. But um, take Italy. Italy had been naturally wealthier and actually remained per capita wealthier than Gaul even in this period but it had been raised to the ground um, during the Gothic War between the Ostrogoths and the Byzantines so basically when the Longobards arrived they they found everything already collapsed and there weren't also Italy had had those large senatorial estates that existed in Gaul now these had vanished so the Longobards, for instance, repopulated Italy, exporting much more successfully the, the Germanic Freeman model of the middle owner, or the medium owner, essentially. In Gaul, there wasn't nothing like this. Um, the elites remained elites; they were remaining in the control of these large senatorial estates. Naturally, the balance was a bit different from the one of Mediterranean um, Europe, because um, 
the Franks had eventually a upper hand on, on on those areas, for even even from a military point of view. Even though they, especially the Merovingians, managed to to maintain the the direct control exactly through the cooperation with the local elites, because it was impossible to to enter in Gaul and rule it with iron fist, because there were two powerful elites in there. So that's why also the Franks, for instance, converted straight away from paganism to Catholicism. They didn't. They escaped the Arianism in the middle, because the Franks initially were even less Christianized than peoples like the Goths, for instance. But they they passed directly to Catholicism, thanks to Clovis, because they understood cleverly enough, and it's not easy to do. From a cultural point of view, I mean, from a mindset point of view, to to understand that in order to rule without conflict into the Roman lands, they had to, to be fully Catholic. Uh, the Goths, both in Italy and in, to Spain, also the Longobards, in a relative sense, had troubles for being Arians, um, because the, 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 the places where they went to, to rule were Catholic, and therefore they, they, they didn't like them much. And since the Episcopal elites, especially in the West, were so important, it, it was a kind of a problem to, uh, to I mean, on the long run, also for demographic um, dynamics to, to hold in that way. The barbarians were really a few. You know, I mean, the Germans that settled into Western Europe were, weren't really so many. I mean, there were many for the time, but there were not more than some tens of thousands, rarely more than 100,000, so the, the populations of certain provinces now counted in millions, so they couldn't, um, they, they, they had no reason, and no way they had to resist eventually the integration, um, and that's the reason why also the, the Franks were, the Merovingians, the Clovis principally, was so clever to understand that if they if the Franks wanted, to, if the Merovingian, his dynasty, his family wanted to rule over Gaul, they had necessarily to mix with this elite. As a result, Gaul basically maintained this highly unequal, um, unequal society. As we said before, at this time, for instance, Gaul w was um, definitely richer than than Italy, but the Italian population was per capita richer than the Gallic one. Because in the Gallic society, the majority of wealth was concentrated in the hands of a very few people, these very f powerful aristocrats, that sometimes, as individuals, as provincial lords, had even more land, private land, than the Longobard king in Italy. Um, and and this process is very important for explaining Gallic history because it tells you that all those military retinues that we attribute somehow to, to the Carolingians in their development through the Vassalatic beneficiary system, the beginning of the so called feudalism, this is a kind of anachronism, especially for Carolingian times, but in the in the essence here you know, it's this highly stratified clientelly society based on, on military retinues already existed in Gaul before. The, the Carolingians just amplified it, intensified it, uh, kind of standardized it, and they, they created their own empire on this. But it already existed, and it went along to the detriment of the same uh, Frankish power with this fundamentally, and I would say fundamentalistically, private mindset that didn't conceive any form of public, central public authority. So even if, if you look at the history of the Carolingian Empire, there were certain, you know, more enlightened figures like Charlemagne, indeed, or Louis de Pius, that understood at the peak of, of, of the Carolingian power that, that, that if the, the, the dynasty and if the fabric uh, of the empire wanted to you know, had, didn't have to collapse. They had necessarily to start building something more centralized, something like a public institution. That's why they started um, engaging the, the church, the clergy, heavily into this activity because um, they they saw in the church something less privatized than the lay aristocracy. Although 
yeah, was kind of a mistake, but indeed, you know, the church had some kind of more permanent structure than the lay uh, aristocracy. But it it was do it was arguably doomed to fail, and it did fail quite big because the Carolingian Empire basically evaporated I in a very few generations. Um, and why? Because it didn't have sound grounds. It's a bit like the um, you know, once that the borders had been overstretched, that resources in this sense were exhausted, and that this society had been based on military retinues that were based on locally scattered all over the empire, but this concession of a private beneficium essentially was theoretically public, but de facto was controlled by the, the individual lords. It was obvious that these lords would basically turn one against the other, and, and the Carolingians basically destroyed themselves in some of the major, you know, I believe the major battles the Carolingians fought were actually battles fought between themselves to take the battle of Fontenoy. Massive, uh, you know, battle. We, we don't know much about it in, tactically, but we know it was uh, at least one of the largest, perhaps even the largest battle the Carolingians ever fought. And that was the one against the other. Um, so, to make the long story short, um, there was a very strongly, strong aristocratic and warlike ethos that permeated uh, Frankish society and that made it very difficult to, for a public authority to make its way. And, and if you look at the rise of the Papinians uh, slash Carolingians, you you observe that basically the only way to strengthen something, uh, to to strengthen the system, to create the, to to create actually to recreate the empire was only through the channel of these clientels. There was no other way out. It's it's paradoxically like uh, uh, when between the the eleventh and thirteenth century, you, s you start seeing these feudal monarchies that essentially emerge unavoidably not from the ancient public um, system of Roman and Germanic tradition, but from this uh, f completely private mindset that informed, at that point, the same nature, the same praxis of the, the same institutions. Mm -hmm. So, I during the course of the 8th century, the term vassus uh, began to designate, especially um, not serfs, but certain people of relatively, you know, of 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 uh, kind of privileged condition, you know, that a sort of gentry practically that um, rendered um, a service um, to the major families of the Frankish aristocracy, and uh, and the worst arguably part of the same aristocracy in some way. It was al there was also very highly, uh, very high social mobility by certain standards at this point, especially through the exercise, the, the excuse me, the, the, the service of, of, of the military service. Um, and, and in fact, this service was mostly armed. And, and, and the various Frankish aristocrats would give in, in exchange for this service this um, land uh, as, uh, in, as a beneficiary, um, and, and and make this system go. Uh, the term vassus, by the way, is a Latinized form of the Celtic term gvas or gvas, um, that basically um, means uh, kind of boy slash serf. Um, it would be. So it has this, it is, yeah, it's kind of uh, serf of some sort, you know, it's, you know younger. The, the idea of seniority was, was developing in this sense also, for this very reason. Um, so as we've said, initially the, the beneficium was theoretically um, just a temporary uh, concession. Usually, the, the land, in fact, wasn't was given in beneficium just for for the length of the service proper. But this has always been quite uh, theoretical. Uh, 
the practice naturally immediately saw the rise of people who considered it beneficial and better on, on their own. You know, right at that point, you have really to consider case by case, uh, and it's very difficult to do it with the sources of the the eighth century, of the early eighth or the century. Um, what this, um, you know, what was the actual level of control over this beneficial by the the master? Um, by the dominus, let's say. So the institution of the vasaticum, um, however, granted the Pepinians to create a very powerful military clientele among the aristocrats that was rewarded, were rewarded first through the, um, initially at least, with the, you know, very um, substantial familiary um, the family properties of, of the same dynasty, and eventually with other lands. There were either the the public ones of the the tax land, essentially of, of royal of the royal fiscus, or the immense ecclesiastical estates. This is kind of important to understand even certain uh, cultural broadly cultural but also political relations for instance Charles Martel um, was adversed by the church highly you know during his lifetime although he was a hero you know the one who crushed the Arabs and uh, Poitiers and so on it, um, it was a great leader Charles Martel was a freaking good leader in many ways but he had his, the clergy against him why? because he had started taking the ecclesiastical lands <laughs> to reward his um, his clientels. You know, as we have seen, the Carolingians started from Austrasia, and that's where they had the most of their lands. Then eventually they expanded, they fought against the other majordoms, they expanded, so there were lots of people joining them to be rewarded with this land. At this point, they, the Carolingians started having occupied many public lands, many royal and ecclesiastical lands, began to reward the... Um, their uh, followers with this land, and especially the ecclesiastical ones, because the lands of the, um, the uh, let's say the 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 the, the, re the treasury of the, the revenue of the the royal um, the property was kind of preferably absorbed by the same Carolingians because there, there was some sort of continuity. I mean the, the they were kind of more compact lands that they had been kind of royal lands since some times. Now, the, the Carolingians were doing, however, something new now. It was also new from a, uh, from a geographical point of view. They were actually re... They were putting together, once again, all the Frankish lands. And especially at the outskirts of the empire, those who had the, the aristocracies that had expanded the most were, in fact, the ecclesiastical ones. Those who arguably and probably were um, the most direct the sense of the uh, Gallo-Roman senatorial elite that had greatly turned into, in fact, an ecclesiastical elite from especially these big, I mean, relatively big cities of southern uh, Gaul. They were very Roman in in uh, in tradition and that. Um, had developed these ecclesiastical lordships of the bishops that were expanding as actually political and military lords over the, the surrounding countryside and essentially usurping the public lands. Because while the Merovingians had been butchering each other in, into northern France, these other lands basically just stayed there and watched. They were also often rewarded for their loyalty and their essentially their obedience by the same Merovin branches of the Merovingian dynasty that were hoping to keep them, you know, at bay or and even sometimes giving them some some benefit. So over the centuries, this ecclesiastical um, elites had exp expanded their 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 power over the formerly royal domains that pertained to the king. So when the, the Carolingians arrived and retook all control of all of these lands, they naturally said to the church, look, you have occupied this land. This is of, of the king. 
now we take it back uh, interestingly enough because initially the the, the Franks weren't even uh, excuse me the Carolingians were weren't properly even Frankish kings I mean Charles Martel was not it's just with the uh, pip in the short that the, the Franks are recognized as you know the Merovingian dynasty dies out and the, the the, the Carolingians are actually recognized. So this is important because it tells you that even though the Merovingian power was kind of uh, depleted now and uh, basically devoid by any actual consistent power with the rays of the major domes, still public authority revolved around this um, original Merovingian uh, authority. And, and yeah, essentially. And so, the as a consequence, the clergy, especially of those areas, began to write very nasty things about Charles Martel. Um, so, the truth is that you don't have to imagine the, the terrible, bad Austrasian cavalrymen who came and stole the land of the poor country priest and said, "Oh no, please don't steal my land." And those, ha ha, no, we do it. No, obviously, it, it wasn't like that. It, it was essentially a, um, even a political. It, it was a political, even more than military, strictly military event for which, you know, this land uh, this land was simply claimed back. Um, you can imagine how chaotic, actually, this phase was. Probably it was an order that's difficult to, 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 to grasp, naturally. It did exist, because these societies were relatively chaotic, but there was always a kind of an order. But now this the Austra the, the, this Austrasian dynasty of uh, major domes was, was taking over, and that's how, in fact, the Carolingians uh, uh, obtained the restitution of, of this land. Um, the Carolingians became um, the most powerful um, nobiliar family in the Frankish world. Noble family in the Frankish world. They had the, the largest and more, uh, and more powerful and most powerful clientele. So they were the strongest guys around. So it's thanks to this political and military base that the Pepinids knew this very relatively rapid uh, rise, which, uh, in my opinion, yeah, it's kind of rapid considering th their origin, but it was also very progressive. Um, there is this event in 687 that is a military military event that is the battle of Tertri. Now the battle of Tertri was um the uh, essentially a victory uh of Austrasia um over Neustria and Burgundy combined. Uh Tertri is on the Somme river. Um uh, so this is really the center here in the northeastern France. Mm -hmm. <coughs> where these, most of the action, also these clashes, would, would take place initially. Because it was really the core of Frankish um, power, where that was battled over by these various major domes. So, um, the. Now, the. the background of this was okay the result the story of battle Tertri maybe it's not in, in important now to, to, to tell but the, the important thing is uh, in here um, the uh, Pepin the second of Herstal became de facto the, uh, after this uh, victory the unique um, master of palace of the three kingdoms this doesn't mean however that he he was in full control of the whole situation of course it took it took decades before this power was consolidated effectively but nevertheless this is an important name and an important date actually i think the battle of tertri has been kind of overinflated as this major moment of uh, of rise of the current but Nevertheless, it's important because maybe with, through that battle they would have... By the, by the way, the Carolingians were defeated initially um, 
and it's 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 also interesting in other battle in another battle it's interesting to see how they recovered also you have to consider that um in in this context it was quite difficult to maintain a direct control over everything so you could even defeat one enemy but the point is you know that you couldn't reach his, his nest um and, and 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 from this nest the, you these people could keep fighting and fighting it, it, it's on a smaller scale what uh, had been with these four um split um Merovingian kingdoms de facto that had been fighting each other very close but never kind of been able to to prevail over one another at least with, if not with great instability and with the uh, situation it could be reversed um from a moment to another so one day we might go in deeper detail looking at how this practically happened um the real consolidation i mean the the one that really made a final you know f if you if you want to really refound it the the same pepinid dynasty and really gave it a, a more consistent um power was uh what was uh charles martel charles martel uh or you want to call him he he was the natural son of pippin he was an illegitimate by the way consider always this that also the di dynastic continuity at this point was kind of problematic because charles martel was not even meant to rise to power there were many other um you know even the same brothers and uh, they could you know you imagine what life was at this time you know people dying continuously either in war or of illness so everything was very unstable and that's a, a really a miracle in many ways of of probabilities that eventually the empire that you know that even the Carolingian empire was born at this point um it was all very contingent in many ways um uh, charles martel obtained this um great victory over the um arabs at the battle of uh, poitiers uh, also known battle of tours in 732 um the battle of poitiers is been um we will surely discuss it in another video but it's important to realize w to to frame it well in its importance because many people say oh well it was so important and our people say well it's n it was not important it was actually important but it wasn't so important as at least it was believed in the past i mean in the past the battle of poitiers was considered as like you know that if if the franks had not stopped the arabs there that basically they would oh, taken over the world you no absolutely not they might have at, at best seized aquitaine with relative difficulty and that might have been a big part naturally but uh, even thinking that the franks were at risk because of this but no um these weren't even properly the umayyads that were advancing i mean these were uh the practically certain smaller powers at the, f at the, the frontier of of the muslim of muslim spain that were launching periodical raids on uh, beyond the uh, north of the pyrenees and naturally they, they wanted to expand also the 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 ar the, the um, arab army at poitiers was seemingly not small so you can't say it was just a simple raid it was actually um, a relatively large scale invasion by those time standards so it was something big and but it was partly mm, nothing so new it was just something that was gaining more more strongly on, more on the offensive there were many more important battles at this time nobody thinks about that actually were fought by the byzantines first of all the victory uh on under the byzantine uh you know Tidosian walls and the bosphorus um against the arab siege that could have taken Constantinople also the battle of uh, Akroinos that is a comparable importance of battle of Poitiers but let's say the western historiography has overly emphasized this um, battle because um, essentially on the wake of the same Carolingian propaganda 
naturally, in the West, there was a time we we have emphasized this battle for a kind of a cultural reason because we say, oh, look, we are the ones who eventually crash the Muslims and so on. But uh, it's been, mm, you know, the, the importance of this battle has been over emphasized. It, it was important, but let's give it a broad dimension. Also, because telling the truth, the Battle of Poitiers didn't at all stop the Muslim uh, in, uh, raids into uh, the Muslim invasions into into Gaul. After a few years, the Muslims launched other uh, raids into Gaul, into Provence, and so on, and they they remained there essentially up to the eleventh century. Um, so it's not really the point. the The problem was not really solved. Let's say that. A, a threat of, of 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 the occupation of Aquitaine was uh, adverted. Um, the Franks objectively achieved also a very important victory um, in there from from a psychological point of view. I mean, they they showed the Arabs that that there was someone from the other side that that, that wasn't um, wasn't going to, to come to compromises. The the Frankish army at this time, it is also a relatively early Carolingian army, was already showing to be a freaking good army, um, very high level one, both cavalry and infantry, interestingly enough. And um, it showed the you know the consistency of the Carolingian power as it was rising at the point. So the the Arabs definitely didn't forget. Um, but they, they kept controlling Septimania, for instance. So the south of Gaul was in part, the southwestern Gaul was in their hands. Um, however, I, in the Frankish world, the, the victory of um, Charles Martel uh, uh, at Poitiers um, really produced a, a great um, ideological construction. Because Charles became essentially assumed the role of the uh, defender of Christianity as such. And this was uh, done into in continuity with the Merovingian tradition. This is very important because now the Carolingians had just risen to power. They wanted they, they were hungry. They they were still unsta- relatively unstable as a power. They had to prove they had the 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 authority, the actual power to you know to, to assume the take the lead of the Frankish world even over the the, the, the Merovingians so um, there was a lot of uh, the, um, of propagandistic production at this time it's very interesting and it's part this, the same um, these are partly the same sources that eventually emphasize in fact the, the great victory of Poitiers as you know it's kind of world changing thing but it wasn't really of that magnitude Nevertheless, um, this victory contributed to strengthen the prestige and the authority of Charles Martel all over Gaul um, and favored the projects of restoration of the Frankish domain, a uh, dominion, sorry, uh, also in other lands of the empire. Um, definitely Aquitaine at this point was regarding the Franks also as a very important protectors uh, once again. But uh, this allowed also the the Carolingians to to expand in towards other directions. For instance, in Germany. Excuse me, I drink a little bit. In fact, in the same years of Poitiers, uh, Charles Martel launched a series of uh, military campaigns uh, repelling the incursions of the Saxons and of the Frisians that definitely were a pain in the behind on the northeastern frontier and, and uh, as Austrasians the Carolingians perfectly knew what, how these guys were and Charles also subdued the duchies of Alamannia and Bavaria this is important because it, that equated essentially to expand into these um, um, upper Rhine and um, an upper and high Danube um, direction, which was very important for trade, also with uh, with southern Europe, um, 
and actually also with Constantinople, with the uh, with the Black Sea. Um, and uh, there were other broader, probably strategical, you know, needs also at this point. The, the relation with Longobard Italy in part were um, to to deteriorate. Um, Charles Martel had actually asked also the help of the Longobard king Liutprand to intervene into southern France when uh, into southern Gaul when uh, when the Arabs were invading. So were many players at this point in the scenario. The the Frisians and the Saxons were these kind of uh, more primitive and warlike Germanic populations that were creating problems. The Frisians were well, the Saxons were a big chunk. It was a big. The continental Saxons were were a solid power that now uh, was definitely fragmented, but was capable of common military organization. So they 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 had been this big, uh, relatively big enemy that was probably didn't have enormous offensive capabilities because the Saxons couldn't practically expand at this point into the Frankish lands. But the raids had been very very hard sometimes to stop they were hitting at the heart of the Austrasian lands um, and this was not comforting uh, especially for the Carolingians that were you know based on there initially as in their their own power and so on so the Saxons eventually were were finally crushed by Charles nephew uh, Charles in fact <laughs> Charlemagne um, but they, they, they took years, it took generations to, to, to subdue them. Uh, the Frisians were kind of similar, actually. They were more kind of maritime people. They had their own piracy that also harassed the, uh, the, the North Sea, the, the Channel in part. And they were difficult to, to attack because they lived into these marshy areas and in, in these islands. So eventually, those were also kind of a problem. Um... The Aquitanians had been something similar. Um, the Aquitanians had never quite liked the Franks, but let's say now, that with the arrival of the Arabs uh, during the 8th century, they, they also were curbed because now they were between Hammer and Anvil. So between the two, they preferred definitely the Franks over the Arabs. And they, you know, the, the Arabs invasions, the Arab invasion cons contributed to consolidate Frankish power also into Aquitaine because now th these guys were asking essentially for defense in part. Um, another important chapter of this phase is the um, the parallel process of an evangelization of the new conquer newly conquered lands. Um, as we've seen, the Franks weren't were Christian, but they weren't particularly, you know, educated in, in that field. So, uh, the, however, the the Carolingians immediately spotted the the advantages that could derive from the expansion of, you know, from from evangelization in general, um, because um, the Christianization of certain lands equated also to the construction of certain infrastructures um, of uh, of the the creation of certain ma means of control um, and uh, as we've seen the church was also a, a, a useful tool to kind of ba counterbalance the lay aristocracy so uh, th at this point um, th th the the greatest role of the evangelization was played by the anglo-saxon uh, missionary monks that coming from the British islands um, began to uh, re um, re-evangelize, let's say, uh, partly the uh, to revive definitely Christian education into into the Frankish lands, but also comforting the the Frankish expansion into especially into Germany, where they built um, several great abbeys. The most famous are definitely Echternach uh, in 698, Reichenau in 724 and Fulda in 744. So in regions that up to that time had not known um, a big deal of urbanization, if not at all actually, um, and from which it, the monasteries became the, the, into which the monasteries became the new center of um, 
irradiation, not just of Christianity, but also of the of the same Carolingians models. Mm -hmm. The Carolingians in parallel were kind of um, colonizing parts of, Ger especially of central and southern Germany. Um, yeah, the Mer the Mer actually the Merovingians had started this uh, back in the sixth century. In the sense. There were large parts of Thuringia and Alamannia that were colonized. So were the Romans actually, if you think about it, what the Romans had mm, given up by saying, okay, let's stop to, to the Rhine, essentially. Well, the, the, the Merovingians went on. Naturally, the fact that the were Germans themselves had some impact, but it was not easy and not to be given for granted that by the 6th and the 7th century, uh, you know, power like the, Carol the the Merovingian one would expand further into those lands, and the Carolingians were essentially um, continuing the the Merovingian policy, the Merovingian legacy, under this point of view. So at this point, um, the major dome had uh, become the fa uh, de facto king, so that when in 737 the uh, Merovingian king Theoderic IV um, died. Um, Charles Martel, that as majordom had was meant also to guide the the uh, the election of the uh, the succession of the Merovingian kings, actually didn't elect uh, anyone else. The throne remained empty. So. This was important uh, from a political point of view because it was essentially um, asserting uh, the Carolingian power without actually usurping the the Merovingian dynasty in itself, but simply just stopping it for <laughs> for being elected. And eventually, the Merovingians were formally liquidated um, uh, under. Charles' son, um, Pippin the Short, when having tied new relation with new um, with, with the papacy, that at this time was you know not in very good relations, nor with with Constantinople, nor with Longobards, um, allowed um, the Frankish ruler, uh, the, the Carolingian ruler, to. Um, deposed the last Merovingian king, Kilperic uh, III, in 751. Now, Kilperic III, or Kilpericus as you want to call him, um, was um, was not even properly a Merovingian, seemingly. I mean, his uh, origins were rather obscure, but there were, in, in this reveals actually a, a, a very interesting dynamic that is once again, how important the Merovingians had been and how they were essentially embodying up to that point the the, the legitimate uh, ruling dynasty into into the Frankish kingdom. So important this dynasty had become that it couldn't be excluded by the mystics of the mystic of, of, of the Frankish monarchy, not even when it was basically devoid of any concrete power. So it seems that Kilperic III was actually someone who had been created as a fake Merovingian, even though he, he wasn't even a Merovingian blood, just to say, okay, let's let's use another one, because we need it as a puppet in front of the, of the rest of the Frankish nobility, because we have to, 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 to prove that we are somewhat uh, still as Carolingians still legitimated by this this force. So 751 is an important time because at this point um, the annals of the Frankish court tell us that in 750 two ambassadors had um, been sent to Pope Zachariah to ask him whether he w whether um, um, it would have b had to, to become king he who um, basically owned a title but um, didn't own any power or, the, or whether it had to be he who actually 
exercise power. So this was a very now this is a kind of a legend. Naturally, you can imagine that this was much more, much less poetic in in practice, much less anecdotal. But so Zachariah naturally answered at that point um, that um, it was that power had definitely to be exercised by th those who, who had had it, uh, because it was God essentially that that gives every kind of a earthly power so if it that had been chosen by God um, to rule effectively that he had to become to become king so in this way uh, the Pope um, supported and the uh, ideological legitimization for the ascent to the throne of the new Carolingian dynasty <coughs> um, uh, so, at this point, I think it's necessary to talk about why this ha had happened also in terms of a broader relations with the, the, Fran the Franks and the papacy. Um, Pippin had, at this point, um, Pippin the Short was elected, or better, had himself elected by the as um, by as king by the assembly of the great... Um, lords of of the kingdom and um he had himself consecrated with the holy oil um he was anon anointed in fact by the bishop boniface hmm? that um and, and eventually this consecration was renewed uh, in 754 uh pontion by the same by the hands of the same pope stephen the second Stephen the second had come uh, into Gaul to search for um, to seek help against the um, the Longobard king Heistulf that at this time had occupied the formerly Byzantine exarchate um, and was now threatening to 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 conquer Rome. This is very interesting. This the episode of Pontion. Is also very interesting because in, in this occasion, Pope Stephen II consecrated not just Pippin as King of France, but also the sons of Pippin. In fact, the, the young Charlemagne um, and his brother were there. Um, so uh, this was extremely important from a symbolical point of view because it's it sort of established a sur uh, an er um, hereditary uh, de facto and conferred. The, f the 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 grounding the foundation for a uh, sacralization of the uh, Frankish uh, royal family. Um, as we have said, this was not really a new. Um, the concept of sacrality of the king uh, was uh, something very ancient. Definitely, most of the legitimization, especially in the, in the Carolingian um, milieu, was um, supported by the better testamentary uh, tradition of the holy anointing of the kings of Israel. Um, in fact, the Carolingians were, uh, if you look at Carolingian history uh, and culture, you realize that they were almost completely devoid of, uh, better, uh, of, um, of New Testament's um, references. The, the Carolingians were totally in love with the, vet with the Old Testament uh, also because it stressed not just the sacralization of their, their own kings that had been out there since the time of the Merovingians, but also stressed the, the military character of that kingship and the divine support given to, to the Frankish armies. The Carolingians thought that the Franks were um, the other great chosen people in history, like the Jews and the Romans. So they felt um, ideologically committed in this um, enterprise of leading Christianity, at least in the West, given that now the empire had also over uh, had was f uh, the Carolingian Empire was over uh, was expanding fast, and could um, now harbor new uh, ambition of universal um, dominion. If you're interested about this Carolingian interest towards the Old Testament King David was one of the 
favorite figures of Charlemagne, for instance. Uh, I made a video recently that is well, not so recently anymore, but it's still kind of interesting. Um, this video is called The Liturgy of War, the idea of conflict from Christian sacramentaries from the 4th to the 11th century. And in the last part, I comment also on this, on how the, the, the Frankish world was kind of creating its own um, mystics of, 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 of monarchy, its ideology, uh, based on... Um, and the sacrality of, of, of kings, um, that passed, in fact, from the, Car the Merovingian dynasty into the Carolingian one. It was also at the base of further developments of medieval kingship uh, over the centuries. So, um, at this point, Uh, the the Carolingians had themselves um, f acclaimed by the f the assembly of the great uh, nobility. That is, in this sense, was meant to represent still the old Germanic tradition of the um, of the uh, election of the kings in arms by the armed. Um, the assembly of, of the freemen, of, of the military men. This was a kind of naturally a very different context from you know, the tribal one back in the day. Now this was a bit of all of an hypocrisy because the great n noblemen now were clients of the St. Carolingians. They, they had interests to support them. There was not anymore a true Frankish people in the sense that you know the tribesmen now didn't exist as such anymore. Uh, they had turned into peasants, or like more like. S uh, so, that there were there was definitely a, still a body of freemen that, had a, an impact on politics in military matters. But still now, it was an aristocracy on the rise. It was increasingly, dictating the, the direction, the political direction of the, of the Franks. Um, so, at this time, the the Vassaticum was being um, brought, in fact, to to, to the very top of this hierarchy because the acclamation um, of the new king entailed a um, you know a, a proof of a, a sort of of an oath of allegiance of obedience towards a sovereign that was legitimized by the holy anointing as well so it was everything but you know political power military power uh, religious legitimization uh, everything converged um, into drawing this a new ideology of kingship that was reinforced by the Carolingians through this actually very important political goals because also in here the relation with the papacy were worked um, the the, the St. Carolingians, St. Franks had been tied to Rome but naturally had been cautious now at developing these new uh, relations because they were also pretty um, they wanted to stress their own autonomy from, from the Church of Rome in some way as, as power so this from here we find that the, the, the very first perplexities and ambiguities in the relation between the Empire and the Papacy and um, by the way, the, the, sometimes I, I stress the fact that the, now the Carolingians were searching for a kind of a universal thing, but it really the major ideological developments in this sense were were a bit later. Came a bit later, mostly during the Ottonian times. I mean, in Carolingian times, what the the Carolingians want to be recognized was formally their political and military power over the West. Uh, even from a religious point of view, they were very ca cautious, and they they weren't even you know the same concept of Roman Empire was something that had to be handled with care, and the Carolingians knew that not because they felt less than the Roman Empire. Actually, probably they 
they felt of themselves to be like the greatest rulers of in, in history and that's how by the way their own um, propaganda and their own legacy w would have made them remembered also later into the Holy Roman Empire I mean there, there were certain into the low middle ages there were certain laws that were enforced by sometimes they were at least presented by the Holy Roman Emperors by you know saying you look Charlemagne did it back in the day you know it was very important also in the clash for investitures to look at the models of Charlemagne and, and the papacy to say you know what is the Charlemagne did because he was thought to be the founder of the empire the, the true the best emperor together with Constantine uh, Charlemagne uh, eventually was surrounded by sort of aura, aura of, of holiness in in the uh, in tradition in the legion in into medieval Europe so this had very been very important things but at, in actual Carolingian times you know the reality was naturally very very different and also conceptions were very very different after all it was the the same Frankish aristocracy that at the end of the day made it made the Carolingian Empire collapse so so the the effective power of these kings was relative at least at a certain up to uh, you know from a certain point onwards um, there is to say as we were um, mentioning in the beginning that to further strength um, its own new position the new uh, its own position, the new dynasty um, launched a sort of um, denigratory campaign towards the Merovingians. Um, so th the Carolingians now wanted to stress essentially that the Merovingians had been inept, and th this was naturally aimed at justifying the what had been de facto the 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 soft usurpation of Car of uh, of Merovingian power by the hands of the Carolingians, um, and in fact, at the time, probably wasn't even something so important as the this propaganda actually culminated in the historiographical works that were composed in the Carolingian court uh, at the beginning of the ninth century. So, in a time that was already very, you know very relatively late. It was essentially two or three generations um or even more actually later uh than the you know the disappearance of the of the same Merovingians. So uh, it was naturally done I in a context where the Carolingian Empire had achieved, by the way, much more than, than what it did under Charles Mart uh, uh, under Pippin the Short through chiefly through the conquests of uh, of Charlemagne, um, and at a point into which the the Carolingians na naturally were playing I in the international scenario, having to act as if they, they were, uh, you know, ultra legitimized to be there, and um, it would be interesting to to know. I, I don't know it actually whether this was done mostly from an internal purpose. Or an ex external one, because um, naturally uh, the aristocratic prestige was increasing also over this. So uh, you have to take into consideration also the transformations that were happening within the Frankish politics and society. So probably um, this idea of the Merovingians as inept was. Um, more important for the internal balance of the empire than from the external one. From the external one, the Carolingians were mostly searching, essentially, a um, legitimization from the papacy and from even from the, the Byzantines. That obviously, they finally recognized the imperial title to the Franks, but not of the Roman imperial title. So they were essentially stressing only the fact that there were emperors. But it's not a few. There were military commanders. It's not really a few. Uh, but at that time, also the Byzantines were not faring excessively well. You know, it's all a matter of context. Um, so the the picture of the um, roi uh, Fenelon, Fenelon. Um, so this idea 
lazy kings, the idler kings that uh, were incapable of guiding their own people, leading their own people. It was very important, especially the, the, the mil strictly military character of the thing, because in Frankish society that was important. You had to be a leader. In order to be a, a leader, you had to be a, co a military commander as well. So, in the f in the Germanic world, it was this idea that if you were not a warrior, was kind of also not kind of a man. So the idea of this um, uh, Merovin last Merovingians um, essentially kept into their own country residences, where it was the major domes who effectively ruled over the the empire, was was even equating them to a sort of feminine picture to the Germanic mindset that was anti. It was very delegitimizing. I don't know whether it exists in English as a term, but it's important because um, th also this picture of the 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 roi Fanant would remain very long as a stereotype. It's um, that's how the Merovingians were remembered um, through the centuries. So maybe actually I'm. I don't think the Merovingians were so extremely inept. They also found themselves into a difficult, a relatively difficult situation where it was from which it was easy, relatively difficult to escape from. Okay, so yeah, this is mostly what I wanted to to tell today, and um, we will. Definitely talk about these topics in other, on other occasions. Um, we, uh, I think, Car th this part. Of, I think the the most fascinating part of Carolingian history is actually the the beginning and the end. The central part. It's like a bit like the Roman Empire. At least for my, I like more. You know, the Republican times and the late Roman times, and say that the actual early empire but it's it's important because it, it makes you understand how these systems were formed and how they eventually transitioned it it helps you to to frame the the, the thing into a broader um, system that is important to, to bear in mind Okay, so for now, I just hope that um, you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like, or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.